Hi and welcome back to another video. On my table you can see the Inno 3D iChill Frostbite Ultra. A few months ago we were checking out the normal 4090 iChill Frostbite, which was a great performing card. It had low temperatures, almost no coil wine, but it was also limited in power limit by 450 watt. And all this kind of didn't fit together with the marketing, which was stating that's a brutal by nature card and I don't know, but the card itself was nice, but it was just too normal, I would say, when it comes to comparison for the marketing. Now, Inno3D listened to our feedback and on our table, we have the Inno3D iChill Frostbite 4090 Ultra version, which is a little bit different. It has some tweaks here and there on the cooler. I'm not sure if the PCB is different. We will find that out once we disassemble the cart, but it also has an upgraded power limit. So it should maybe perform better, higher clocks. We will find out in today's video. Hetzner is a leading hosting provider and data center operator in Europe with hundreds of thousands of servers in operation. By combining its strengths in innovative technology, attractive prices, expert customer service, Hetzner expanded its marketing growth within and outside Europe. They operate their very own high-tech data centers in Nuremberg and Falkenstein, both located in Germany and in Helsinki, Finland. Hetzner not only provides high-performance cloud servers at an affordable price, but also incredibly powerful dedicated servers capable of handling any project. Aside from these products, you can also get high-quality storage products and a variety of other services. Click on the link below and check out Hetzner's portfolio. Before we start into a close-up of the card, I quickly want to discuss a few aspects about the price. I can only talk about the German prices right now, but at least if you're looking for a water-cooled build, this could actually be interesting because at least looking at the previous normal iChill Frostbite 4090, this one is priced quite interestingly in Germany because a normal 4090 starts somewhere between 1600 and 1650 euro, whereas this costs about 1780. So you buy an extra of about 150, 180 euro, but then you get a card which already has a water cooler mounted and is obviously also covered by warranty. Because if you would get a normal 4090 for maybe 1650 to 1700 and then you also buy the water block, you might end up in a similar price region, but it might not be covered by a warranty and you also have extra effort. So from my perspective, this could actually be quite interesting. So, but let's check up the card in more detail. Unfortunately, I don't have the other card anymore, the normal iChill as direct comparison, but you can also check out my old video if you want to take a look at this one. But apart from that, we only have minor changes to the block itself. Generally speaking, this looks great. Again, it's the similar type of Alpha Cool water block, which just looking at the manufacturing quality looks great. And it's also a huge amount of copper which they use. So if you look from the side, this is at least 11 or 12 millimeter of copper base plate, which is just enormous, which also explains why this is extremely heavy. I didn't weight it yet, but I guess it's something about two kilogram, which is definitely heavy, especially considering how small this card is. When it comes to the pure size of the card, the dimensions, this card is now slightly longer by, I guess, about three centimeters. This part on the back did not exist. We have an RGB strip sitting in the bottom. One way to make this card look even more elegant would be to have a cover on top so you don't see the strip itself, but that's like a tiny detail. Apart from that, the screws look nice and the panel also, or the terminal also changed. Prior to this one, it was uh, acrylic or at least plastic terminal. Now this part on top here, the cover is aluminum, which looks nice, but the inside should be nickel plated brass. So that's definitely something that changed and improved. The backplate itself changed only a little bit. Prior to that, we had a print on here with the Frostbite logo, which is not here anymore. And now we have the Alpha Cool X, I guess that's Frostbite logo. Apart from that, it's still a massive aluminum backplate. And we have some thick looking thermal pads in between. And if you now also pay attention to the PCB, you will notice that the card might not have changed. Might still be exactly the same PCB. I'm not sure why they extended the cooler, but might just be the same card with a slightly different shaped cooler, slightly extended, probably to fit the logo on the front. Apart from that, nothing special on the backside. The only thing you should be aware of if you use a board like that, a tiny one where you use the first PCIe slot as position, it's a bit tight when it comes to the backplate and the IO shield clearance right here. 
it's kind of colliding if you want to have it like fully straight but it would be the same thing you would have with an EK block with a thick back plate and most high-end boards would use the second position of PCIe slot and there it should be no problem. I also want to note that I checked the weight of the card and it's just above two kilogram. As you can see the setup is up and running the block is also filled with water and I also want to highlight well we start from the beginning. So first of all water inlet is here. Water splits to left and right and it can also access all the way to the right already. So it can inlet, outlet directly, so very short path. At the same time there are multiple other paths, so it can go through here, cool some additional stuff down there, you can see some flow right here, there's also some air still trapped inside and then there is a channel on the right for VRM cooling and then there is this channel on the left for VRM cooling and as you can see the water currently does not flow through there which is probably a result of me doing this vertical mount, which I think is still realistic because that's something you could have in your daily system. A lot of people are fan of vertical mount. And at the same time, the pump is running a rather low pump speed. Currently, I already increased it to 50% on the D5, which is something I usually wouldn't run because you can hear the pump more clearly. And you can see the water level is currently up here. When I was running a 30% pump speed, which is my personal standard setting, the water level was only up to here. And even now with 50% pump speed, as you can see, the water does not go through the channel on the left. So that is, yeah, that's not ideal. That's definitely not ideal. So regarding this entire thing with the water channel and having this air inside and no flow on this area right here, I already pointed this out in the previous video where I also was running 100% pump speed, but I dialed down the pump speed after, I don't know, a few months ago, because it's just annoying doing the videos and testing while always listening to the D5 running at 100%. So I, that's why I tuned it down originally to 30%. And now I increased it to 50%, which also still didn't fix it when it comes to like the, the flow rate. I want to point out though that my guess, my personal guess is that it's not going to have a huge impact on the temperatures of the VRM because there is still a huge amount of copper in this block which will definitely be conductive like thermally conductive enough to make sure it can dissipate the heat from the VRM but it's just it's just not ideal and we already pointed this out already in the previous video like long time ago it's I think more than half a year ago and they should have fixed this I mean they did some rework on the terminal and everything so they could have improved this because like looking at the channels doesn't really make a lot of sense to me how they made it with like splitting this up in in this area right here could have been improved. That's something I still want to look at deeper, probably tomorrow for you, it will be in a few minutes. But I first want to check out the general performance. I first have to also flash the BIOS of the GPU and also check out GPU temperature and everything under load because that's, we, we only have the stock condition once to check this. And then after that, we can dis disassemble the card and maybe do some adjustments and also attach some thermal sensors. First of all, we're looking at performance in Times by Extreme GT1, where you can see we have a score of 126.7 FPS, whereas with the stock iChill, the non-ultra version, we had 126, so only a tiny performance difference. The clock in the GT1 was 2820 megahertz, which is also very close to the stock version. One reason for the small increase of performance is mainly that this GPU is not power limited in 3D Mark by stock configuration. As you can see, board power draw is somewhere between 400 and 420 watt. So just increasing the power target, leaving the card stock will not give you extra performance here. To overclock this card, I'm going to try their own tool, which is the Inno 3D TuneIt. And there's a few things. So first of all, we can now increase the power target plus 20% is no problem. One thing I would like to give them as a future adjustment point is that this right here is the current readout but at the same time it's also somewhat of the setting point so that's a bit weird so if i'm trying to let's say set plus plus 100 megahertz it's you can see it it goes to the 3d clock and then it jumps jumps down back to the monitored clock so it's kind of mixed between setting and like the actual monitored frequency which is a bit confusing so that's something that could be yeah, adjusted in the future so one readout could be the set clock and the other one could be the actual uh, readout clock. 
And this is where the open power limit is important if you want to do overclocking. This specific GPU and memory both perform extremely well. We have 3 GHz on the GPU and just above 1500 MHz on the memory, which is definitely above average when it comes to 4090s. And you can see that it will draw somewhat between 440 and maybe 460 in the GT1, so that's where you already need the open power limit. If you would go to the GT2, then you can see it also exceeds 500 watts. So if you want to do serious overclocking, the open power limit would be necessary. And that's how we can make this performance happen, which is also the best 4090 I had so far personally, at least when it comes to ambient cooling without modifications. We are closing in on 135 FPS. And previous, my best score was with an Aorus Master about 131 FPS. So that's definitely a very solid result. And also if we inspect the temperatures further, you can see this is the overclocked state with 3 GHz on the GPU. And you can see that the core always stays somewhere between like 43 and 45 degrees Celsius, which is definitely a great result just talking about the GPU temperature itself. As you can see, I already removed the backplate of the card and placed two temperature sensors behind the VRM to check out if there is a temperature difference between the two sides, if there would be a cooling issue or not. We are measuring the back side and that should give us a good indication of the front side temperature. For example, if you measure 50 degrees Celsius on the back, it's something between maybe 55 to 60 on the front components. While the card was on the table and when I moved it around, obviously, there was also some water in this area because it could be that you have to maybe break the surface tension to get some tiny amount of water flow across here, but that didn't seem to help. Right now I'm running some load on the card with the temperature sensors attached and that's what you can see right now. Now the interesting thing is that the left one, this is this one, it's the one with the, the, the problem is actually colder than the right one, at least after, I don't know, like three minutes of load. I will keep this running for half an hour and then we check back. Obviously the temperature increased during that time, but as you can see, there is pretty much no difference between the left and the right side. Both are within one degree Celsius. You could say they are equal. And there we have it. And I don't want to say that I was wrong because I still think this could be improved to also have water flow over there. But you can see that this entire area has no direct contact with water. There is no water flowing through. Still, the temperature is perfectly fine. It's the same as on the right side with no water directly flowing through this channel. In addition to 3D mark, I also performed some 4K benchmarking in Battlefield 2042 to compare the Ultra to the previous normal Frostbite and also the Nvidia Founders Edition. Compared to the Founders Edition, you can straight notice that the water-cooled card will consume slightly less power and also perform slightly better. This could be a result due to the better cooling, the water cooling, but it could also just be the variance in the different boost behavior of the individual GPUs. In the gaming scenario itself, the Frostbite Ultra just performs exactly the same as the previous non-Ultra card. With overclocking though, we can see about 10% performance increase, but at the same time also a 15% increase in power consumption. As you can see, I now removed the cooler to also check if there is anything different underneath the water block itself. And indeed, there is a lot that's different, especially if you compare the left and the right side of the power stages to the previous card, because we now have eight phases more when it comes to VRM power delivery. So eight times more capacitor, power stages, and also inductors, which means that at least theoretically speaking, there will be less load on the individual phase, and it could also be better for longevity. Back then in the day, it was also better for overclocking, but this day nowadays, it's not really different. Just the plain amount of phases doesn't really help when it just comes to pure frequency for GPU clock, but definitely for temperatures, this will be better than the previous card. Both thermal paste and also the pad application was definitely good. Also the pad choice is very good because those are high performance pads which will lead to good temperature. And it's the same on the paste application because we could already see that under load the temperatures looked very good. I also want to highlight that I tried measuring, not measuring, but recording the coil wine of this card with this microphone, which seems to be kind of impossible. At least it was not picking up anything because the coil wine is so quiet 
that you cannot really hear it. And it was already good on the previous card, but on the Ultra, might be related to the different VRM configuration, it is even better. So coil wine on this card is absolutely superb, at least on this specific sample that I have. And generally speaking, there is very little I would complain about when it comes to this card. They could make maybe the backplate a bit thinner, so it's maybe less of an issue in the top PCIe slot. And also they could have reworked the block better because they definitely changed something on the block compared to the previous iChill Frostbite. And we already complained about the water flow in front on the previous one. So they could have fixed this already. but. Alpha Cool, maybe work on this in the future because even though technically it's not going to make a difference, I think people might complain and that's usually better to just rework it, make it right before you get any kind of complaints. But just from a technical perspective, you could see that the front part where there was no water flow at all had the same temperature as the back part. And we were recording below 50 degrees Celsius on the VRM, which is so far away from being any kind of problem. It's like the ideal temperature. So yeah, I'm not gonna complain about it, but it's something they could definitely improve for the future. Apart from the Ultra, by the way, there is also a Pro version, which I kind of would probably prefer over this one. And the Pro version seems to be slimmer, has some kind of like a carbon cover on top and it has connectors on the back, which might be also something interesting for you to check out if you're considering to get one of those pre-assembled water cooling cards for your next build. All right, thanks for tuning in, see you next time, bye bye.